At the end of March, Nashville was hit with a flash flood that dropped seven inches of water and left seven people dead. My family and I visited Whitsitt Park two weeks later, and we were horrified to see the amount of trash left in the flood's wake. The trees along the river were choked by plastic bags tangled in their limbs. Whole sleeves of styrofoam containers and cups had been swept away from restaurants, mingling with gas, glass bottles, gallon jugs, and unidentifiable bits of cardboard to smother the banks. As we looked at the devastation, all I could think was, we did this. Our reliance on convenience is harming our world. I felt guilty, angry, and so incredibly sad. In tears, I began to pull a large black trash bag out of the tree closest to us. Ben asked what I was doing, and all I could manage to say was, the trees can't breathe. He nodded, took the bag I disentangled, and began to fill it with trash from the bank at the tree's roots, while I continued to free the branches. We worked for about half an hour to fill the bag, clearing nearly all of the debris from that one tree. Over the past year or so, I have struggled with feeling overwhelmed. Dismantling systemic racism, navigating a pandemic, helping three children with virtual schooling, considering our environmental impact. It's easy to look at the scope of the work that needs to be done and freeze, unsure of where to begin, how to get involved, who to ask for help, whether it's even worth the effort when your contribution will be less than a drop in the bucket. But as I looked at that one tree in Nashville, almost free of plastic and cardboard, I remembered that even one person deciding to do something can make a difference. It really does feel like so much has been thrown at us this last five years, this last year especially. And you're right, uh, it's easy to get overwhelmed and become completely paralyzed by the enormity of everything that needs to be changed and, and fixed. Everything sort of piles on and seems so big and unconquerable. It doesn't help that as a nation, we've sort of been in a leadership vacuum in a lot of ways for the last few years. I think we naturally gravitate towards people who are in charge and we expect them to tell us what to do or how to act or what crisis we should address next. One of my theater kiddos said something a couple months ago when we were chatting about his future post-college and trying to figure out his place in the world. And what he said stuck with me. He said that he needed a more adulty adult to tell him what to do. Now, this guy is a perfectly intelligent, well-educated young man. He can drive and vote and legally drink alcohol and he's gonna be graduating um, cum laude, but he was still looking for somebody to lead him and tell him what to do next. I think at some point deep down, all of us in moments of fear or trial or stepping out into the unknown have wanted somebody to tell us what to do next, right? We, we want somebody to give us the framework in which to move forward to be the more adulty adult for us and make it all better, or at least tell us how we can tackle whatever the next big scary is that we're facing. It's built into our nature. You know, we structure entire governments around this need, and even more so, we structure religions around this need. And when we look at religions around the world, both currently and historically, a common thread is that they almost universally try to address our need for a framework for living, our need for someone to look to in times of trouble, joy, fear. You know, it's funny that you mentioned your student needing a more adulty adult, because as we were clearing the tree, I felt a vague sense of unease as if at any second, somebody was going to ask us what we were up to or tell us to get out of that tree. 
it was almost like I had decided to do something without permission and was now at risk for getting in trouble. But as Representative John Lewis said, we need to get in good trouble. We need to trust the small voice inside that calls us to do the right thing, even when nobody has told us what that thing is or whether it's even okay to do. When I was a child, my mother told me that someday I'd be a strong, independent woman and that that meant I had a responsibility to use my voice. She taught me to speak truth to power, especially in spaces where others could not, even when that power was hers. As a social worker, my mother has dedicated her life to fighting injustice and serving those who need help, keeping that mission at the center of everything she does. I've watched her celebrate her successes and pick herself back up time and again when success wasn't the outcome. I am truly fortunate to have been raised by a woman who trusted herself and did the right thing, even when it would have been easier to do otherwise. Our current societal power structures tell us that authority comes from somewhere else. Whether it's God, a parent, a teacher, or a police officer, we are taught to look for the person in charge and let them handle the tough stuff. It can be deeply uncomfortable, even scary, to realize that we are all that person, that we have the power to make an impact with our words and actions, and we have the ability to affect change for good or bad. But if we push past that discomfort, we might find that stepping into our power and living into our values gives us the confidence, strength, and deep certainty needed to push past obstacles and change our world. It's kind of funny how that works, isn't it? When you say it, it sounds intimidating and, and really kind of overwhelming, but when you really look at it, every time we do something, anything that lives into our values, we actually become the leaders without even realizing it. I know that we tend to, um, in general, just as humans and as women, we tend to minimize the things we do because we're you know, just one person or just doing what we thought was right. But the reality is that every small action, every bit of good trouble, it helps lay the framework of progress and change and forward motion, not just for ourselves, but for everybody around us. I think it can be simultaneously easier and harder for us as you use in a religious context to address this and to embrace this concept because we as a religion don't have one particular set of doctrine or dogma that we rely on as a framework for you know what we should do next. We have our seven principles and they are incredibly broad for a reason. And there's not one person or group pointing at us and saying, you know, you all do it this way, right? We do everything by democracy, by committee, by local congregation, and by individuality. And what we do say is that we're all connected. And what we do and how we live and how we interact with each other and how we interact with the world is going to impact others like ripples on a pond. I've started reminding myself that when I find myself doing something I believe needs to be done or standing up for something that needs to be amplified, that I'm giving somebody else the gift of going seconds. I can't remember exactly where I first heard that phrase, but it has changed my whole thought process around how I use my voice. I had a moment of, you know, wait a second, what, what if I'm the one I've been waiting for? Like, I can do the thing. I can say the thing. I can help build the thing. Maybe if I do the thing, other folks will be brave and do the thing too. And wouldn't you know, as we walked back to our car from the river, we saw a large group of volunteers on their lunch break. They weren't part of any organization, didn't work for Nashville's Department of Parks and Rec. They were just local people who'd realized that they had to pitch in and they weren't alone. Neither are we. 
I'd never heard of giving someone the gift of going second until you mentioned it, but I had to laugh because it is so true. Change is hard and being the first one through that brick wall can take a heavy toll. You can become a lightning rod for the fears of others, an easy target for them to push back against. But if you hold fast to your purpose, call on your support system and persist in making a better way, you may be surprised to find that there are those who are willing to walk with you, even if the path still needs to be cleared. You may then be absolutely flabbergasted when those people step into their own power and take that path in a beautiful direction you never could have envisioned. Listening to my small voice has shattered my comfort zone on numerous occasions, sometimes making me wonder if I'm out of my mind for fighting so hard to hear it. But when I look at the outcomes, I see the impact of my labor and it is always worth it. That voice led me here, to my partner, our family, this congregation and community, even an accidental alliance. And if I, as one partner, one mom and stepmom, one congregant can do something good on this Zoom channel, imagine how much better it could be with all of us. As Reverend Aya quoted last week, the master's tools will never dismantle the master's house. Over the past year, many systemic injustices have been laid bare. We've watched the death toll continue to rise across the globe as COVID rampages. We've watched Derek Chauvin murder George Floyd, holding our breath until the verdict was read. We've watched our earth begin to heal as people stayed home, illustrating how our actions impact this planet and one another. With all of this staring us fully in the face, each of us has a choice to make, a choice we will all have to live with for the rest of our days. Do we close our eyes and go back to sleep, comfortable in the certainty that someone somewhere will make it all okay? Or do we stare back at the challenges in front of us and rise to face them? I think that we, look for somebody to tell us what choices to make, what actions to take, because deciding to take a stand is scary. We tell ourselves that we're not good enough, strong enough, powerful enough, brave enough, fill in the blank enough. But the reality is that we are, and we are the ones we've all been waiting for. And when we stand up or step out, no matter how small we think our voice is, we are showing the way for all the other people in our lives who will then realize that they too are the people they've been waiting for. In the musical Hades Town, because you know, we couldn't get through a sermon or a service with me without referencing some sort of musical. Uh, in the musical Hades Town, there's this one refrain that sticks with me and it says, show the way so we can see show the way the world could be if you can do it so can she and if she can do it so can we so show us the way it reminds me that we're the way makers we're the ones we've been waiting for who can change the trajectory of our own lives the lives of our, our communities and eventually maybe the whole world, or at least our corner of it. We are the tools that are going to bring down the master's houses. So let's go, show the way. May it be so. And so it shall be. Amen. So I've only been loud for the last year or so. And if you've ever had a conversation with me, you know how ridiculous that sentence is. I don't have a concept of indoor voice. Um, what I mean when I say I've only just started to be a loud person is this. I was raised as a seen and not heard child. The elders of my life led and I followed. You, you weren't allowed to disagree or speak out against them. This conditioning to be meek and respectful 
led me into a lifetime of following every single rule, regardless of if it was formally instituted or if it was merely implied. I've always tried to be the person to hold my tongue and to keep peace, to never speak out or against someone's opinions, even when they are far from what I agree with or fight for. I've lived my life thus far feeling like unless I was accepted and loved by everyone I interacted with, I wasn't safe. My coworkers, parents, siblings, acquaintances, colleagues, all had to believe I was friendly, accepting and on their side. I presented the most bland and universally accepted version of myself. I didn't get involved in politics. I didn't have an opinion on most of the recent events. I didn't talk about my dating life and I dressed in baggy shapeless clothes that hid my plus size body. I was trying to constantly seek praise from any authority figure. Then last year, George Floyd was murdered. I watched dozens of friends and family members suggest violent and hateful things about him and the protests that sprang up immediately after. I'd spent years biting my tongue about most social justice issues, particularly the Ferguson riots. I never spoke out when the Black Lives Matter movement was founded years ago. I quietly supported, but I never openly discussed it or raised my voice to the cause. The rage and frustration grew as I watched more and more people of color fall victim to the systematic oppression. Being able to see over nine minutes of violence so graphically displayed on every form of social media and then have family members and friends not see it as the act of hate that it was made me feel powerless. I couldn't stand by and remain silent any longer. I stepped out of my comfort zone that day and I spoke up on social media. My post essentially said, Black Lives Matter. If you disagree, unfriend me. It went over so poorly. I lost a brother and a cousin that day, not to mention several dozen Facebook friends. I don't regret those losses. That Saturday, I attended my first protest. Over the last year, I've attended many Black Lives Matter marches and vigils and became more active in speaking out against hate of all kinds. I will no longer avoid talking about LGBTQ plus rights in my family group chat and I try to educate my friends on how to address their unconscious microaggressions against people of color. I see people like Riley and Chris, and I feel like I'm 10 steps behind everyone else. Working on this service with them this week has made me feel so much better about the progress I have made in the last few years. I didn't start at the same point as many others. I wasn't raised to speak out against hate. I came from a place of having to hide this noisy part of myself and only found it well into adulthood. I didn't have the foundation many other people do that they use to build up their voice. I had to build my own framework and to do so, I had to follow the paths that were paved by others. The special music this week is a song from my favorite musical, Hades Town. Wait For Me is about Orpheus leading his love Eurydice out of hell and in the process of doing so, he creates a path for others to follow. This song shows others trying to find a way out, but needing someone to show the way for them. And also how doubt can creep in when forging into the unknown. Making change was not modeled for me. I had to make that change on my own, and I'm still in the process of becoming the leader I want to be. So wait for me, I'm coming too.